We're going to look at Matthew chapter 3 this morning. We've been talking about how there were many people in the Bible who were not so sure about God's call in their life. They didn't think that they could do it, and yet God proved that they could do it with His help. We're going to look at John the Baptist today and see what God did through him. Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So Jesus comes to John and says, Please baptize me. John was baptizing a lot of other people. But uh, it says John didn't want to baptize Jesus. It says he tried to deter him. He was preventing him from being baptized. There was this long line of people and and, uh, John was baptizing everyone. But then when Jesus came, he was, uh, no, no, this isn't right. He was baptizing people in, in water for repentance, it says, just before what we read here today. It says, in those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, For the kingdom of heaven is near. And then in verse 6 of chapter 3, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And then when he's talking to the Pharisees, he says, I baptize you with water for repentance. So the reason why he was baptizing people is because people were repenting of their sins and they wanted to turn their lives around. So John was baptizing them as a sign of that. But the sinless Jesus had no need for repentance. Jesus was without sin. It wasn't like he had anything to repent of. He was free from sin. 1 John 3, 5, But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He had no sin. Why is he here asking to be baptized for repentance like this? So John was saying, No. No, this isn't right. John actually preached that Jesus would be the one who baptizes. He was talking to the Pharisees. He says, After me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not even fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And he goes on from there. But Jesus is supposed to be the one who does the baptizing, not not me, John says. So why is Jesus coming to me to be baptized? This is, this is backwards. This isn't the way it's supposed to be here. And the Son of God, of course, has the authority and the position to be the one who baptizes, so it's not hard to see why John was trying to deter him. This, this, was not, this wasn't right here. John the Baptist was completely inferior to the Son of God, of course, as all of us are. John the Baptist was also inferior by many human standards, too. I mean, John the Baptist, he was a a wild man living in the desert. It says he ate bugs for food and wild honey. By today's standards, he was rabidly judgmental. If you read what he said to these Pharisees a little bit ago, oh man, this, this this guy was somebody who would yell in your face and point right at you and and really be kind of mean. So even by human standards, he was was inferior. He he wasn't really fit. People actually thought he was demon-possessed. There's something wrong with this guy. And not just a little bit. I mean, we all have our quirks and stuff like that. This guy, there's something really wrong with him. He, He lives in the desert. Who does that? Nobody. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. 
So in verse 15, Jesus responds, Let it be so now. It's proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So even though John was definitely inferior and didn't necessarily deserve to be the one to baptize, it was still proper for John to baptize Jesus. Jesus had no sin and no need for baptism of repentance. But just the same, he was there among all of those repenting and seeking baptism. He was, he was there among the people who needed to repent. Jesus was fully righteous, but he was among sinners. And he wasn't just hanging out, he identified with them. Even though Jesus had nothing to repent, he fully identifies with those who do. So you and I, we're, we're sinners in need of a Savior, in need of, of grace. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, didn't just hang out in heaven and look down at us and shake his head or wag his finger. He came down and was one of us. And while he was here, he didn't just sit high and mighty and look down on each one of us. He was with us and he identified with us, even to the point of being someone who needed to repent, even though he didn't need to. Only the only sinless one became like a sinner to save sinners. He became like each one of us so that he might save us. 1 Corinthians 5.21, this is your Bible reading track for today. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And uh, you, pastor, actually used a verse just a few verses before that. If anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Jesus makes us new again by becoming like one of us. So John the Baptist, he was calling people to wake up because the Christ was coming. And this is the first time that Christ actually appears on the scene. And he wasn't even worried to carry Christ's sandals. And yet he was called to baptize this Christ. And the reasons that Jesus gives are kind of kind of ambiguous. It, they kind of raise as many questions as they answer. It says, proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness? Um, what does he mean by proper for us? Does that mean he's saying just you and I, John, right now? Or does that mean all people of all time uh, could go either way? Um, what righteousness is he talking about? Is he talking about his own righteousness that's perfect so that he could save each one of us? Or is this for all of our righteousness that we need to meet too? It doesn't, it, there's a lot of questions there. Matthew, Matthew, in this passage here, he's obviously not trying to answer the why question here. Matthew's point isn't why it was appropriate for John to baptize, but his point was what happened as a result. What happened in the end? So when John obeyed, the heavens open and the Spirit descends. This is, must have been an amazing thing to see. There's a song that we sing, um, It is well with my soul, and that last verse it says, The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. When you look up at the sky right now, you either see blue or clouds or stars in, in the night and everything. But to be able to have the sky rolled back to see heaven itself, where God is there, that must be incredibly amazing. And when this happens, Jesus is confirmed to be the Son of God by heaven itself. So heaven opens up and this booming voice comes and says, This is my Son whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. This, this booming voice. Unmistakable. Okay. Jesus, He's the real thing here. He's not an imposter, as there are many imposters. 
He's the real deal. By obeying, John the Baptist was privileged to inaugurate Jesus' ministry. This is when it all begins for Jesus. Jesus only ministered for about three years of his life. And this is where it begins, right here. He was about 30 years old, it says, when he started. So for 30 years, he was just a regular guy, doing regular stuff, doing work, taking care of his family. And then now, once he's baptized, now his ministry begins. And this is where, this is where the Gospels pick up. John the Baptist was there to inaugurate Jesus' ministry. Let's look at the screen here and let's answer this question together. How does this glory of Christ, our head, benefit us? First, through His Holy Spirit, He pours out His gifts from heaven upon us, His members. Second, by His power, He defends us and keeps us safe from all enemies. So God... And Christ is, is our glory, and as He has ascended into heaven, He now pours His gifts on all of us so that we would serve each other. And we think that we're inadequate to this task, but by His power and His Holy Spirit, He uses each one of us so that we would be a blessing to each other. That's what we're supposed to do. This is what the church is supposed to be about. Each, each person has, has gifts and, and opportunities and resources and we, we use all of these so that we can be a blessing to each other. We as followers of Jesus are ministers of His message. If you have your bulletins here, haven't done this in a while, look at the front of that bulletin. On the front there, kind of in the middle, towards the bottom, it says, Pastor, Reverend Aaron Reisman, but ministers, all the members. All the members. I'm the, I'm the pastor here, but I'm not the only minister. All of you members are ministers here. We're supposed to be ministering to each other. I'm not the only one with gifts here, for sure. Like, like John, we, we, are, we are inadequate to the task of being ministers of the message of Christ. We sure are. But the Lord comes to us and says, let it be so now. We might feel inadequate to do what God calls us to do. But when God comes to us and says, let it be so now, we, we follow through. We obey. Sometimes I think about how you know, why does, why does God call us to do what He could do so much better? I mean, if Jesus was here preaching this message, think about how much better that sermon would be, coming from the source itself. If, if, if Jesus was here, you know, writing cards to, to one another, wouldn't that be, mean so much more? If, if, if Jesus was here praying for us in our times of need, wouldn't that Go so much farther? Why, did, why does God call us to do these things when if Jesus was here, He could do it so much better? That doesn't always make sense, does it? Why would Christ send people like us to do what He could do perfectly? John isn't really given a, a thorough answer here. We don't really have a thorough answer ourselves. We're told to do it. We're told that we are the hands and feet of Christ. We, as the church, the church is the body of Christ. And so each part of this body is supposed to be doing its work so that we can all together be built up into Christ. While the reasons can be mysterious, we, we know that it is proper. This is what we're called to do. It's proper for us in this time and in this place to be servants of each other and be ministers to each other. 
the point of our lives is not why we are put here in these times and these places to witness or testify or share or intercede in prayer for one another. That, the why is, that's not as important. What's important is what happens as a result when we are faithful. When we fulfill our call, heaven is open and Jesus is confirmed to be the Son of God. We are Christ's ambassadors with his message. God has given to us this ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We are supposed to be Christ to each other. Christ is working through each one of us. And what we think we, can, we can't do very well, God is using perfectly in His own ways and in His own times. We in ourselves are inadequate, but not Christ. And He works through us. So speaking of the Lord in your life opens up heaven in everyday life. When you talk about the Lord in your life, that shines a heavenly light on what would otherwise be just ordinary events. So when you hear testimonies like the ones that we hear today, you can see, oh, these are just events that happen in people's life. But when God is brought into that picture, we can see heaven's light on these things. When we tell stories of God's work in our lives, it shines heavenly light. So when you say, for example, God gave me words to speak in this conversation with this person, that shines a heavenly light on what just happened here. When we say some clever words or say the right thing at the right time, it's easy to think, wow, I'm, I'm pretty smart. Look at, look at what I came up with. But if we say, no, God gave me these words to speak, then that clicks for us and for others that, no, God speaks through us. When we say, God answered my prayer, we're reminding ourselves and others that it's not just luck when we pray about something and God comes through for us, this isn't just circumstantial evidence. This is God actually doing what we're asking Him to do. This is God really answering prayer like He does. Otherwise, we might just think we got lucky. If we say God gave me an opportunity and it says these aren't just coincidences here. We, we believe in an all-powerful God. We don't believe in coincidences. We believe that God makes things happen for reasons that we can't always see, but we know that they're there. Can you tell your stories? Bring God into the picture. Shine heavenly light on what otherwise would be ordinary events that don't mean anything. God is at work, and He's at work in each of our lives. Whether we know it or not, we need to notice it, and we need to give Him credit where it's due. John, he obeyed, and he was privileged to inaugurate Jesus' ministry. And he, it, was, it was amazing what opportunity that he had to do that. We need to obey too, whether we're adequate to the task or not. We need to be ministers to each other and to others. We need to be Christ in other people's lives. Yes, he could do it a whole lot better, but that's not the point. The point is that he's given us this mission, this job to do. And like John the Baptist, we need to follow through on that. When we obey, the Spirit comes. And he just might inaugurate Jesus' ministry in somebody's heart. There's, there's words that we speak. There's actions that we can do that 
follow what God has asked us to do, that just might inaugurate Jesus' ministry in somebody's heart. Little acts of love, little words of encouragement, when we bring Christ into this picture of somebody's life or our life, we just might inaugurate the ministry of Jesus in somebody's life. Let's be like John the Baptist and let's follow through on what God calls us to do. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God in heaven, Lord, we know that you could do so much better than, than what we can do, and at least by our own strength. We pray that you would send us your Holy Spirit and the power to do whatever you call us to do. We pray that you would give us your words to speak, your actions to take, and Lord, your initiatives so that you would be praised and that your ministry would go forth in this world and in the lives of others. Help us to be like John the Baptist, where even though we don't understand completely, that we would follow through and that we would see you confirmed as Son of God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.